everybody. My name is Ginny Wong and I'm a Toronto-based actor um, and I was just interviewed by Keith Andrew. Um, I really support what he's doing, um, his mission, and it's very inspiring and it was just a fun little chat that we had and uh, I think you'll have fun too. Fangie Network, and this is a special holiday episode live from Canada. For people who want to know what is the talk show about, the whole point of my talk show is to show people that even with having a word disability, I can sell them out to something. And at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into an example for people out there dealing with any types of word disabilities and disabilities to never give up and prove people wrong. Prove to them that labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be. To prove to them they can stem out something. So hashtag break the labels. With that being said, it's going to be a brand new season. It's got to start in January, but you know what? I want to give myself a holiday gift. Might as well start it now. It's only two weeks. Who really cares about waiting the two weeks? So it's going to be rated. 14 and up, it is freedom of speech, self-expressing. You can say anything you want, express yourself however you want. Of course, and it will be professional, of course, but you have the freedom to express yourself. With that being said, thank you for being a guest on my talk show. We're here with Ms. Wong, you know, the beautiful and talented Ms. Wong from Canada. Thank you for being on my show. The honor's all mine. Now, I'm going to ask you some easy questions and then some hard hitting ones. Okay. So, the first one, it's called Icebreakers. So, it's actually, I call it Icebreakers Roundup. Roundup means, actually, I posted myself. <laughs> icebreakers, like, okay, we, the first time we're meeting, Roundup is actually when we round up the question at the end. Don't mind me. When I don't do my interviews as a way, my disability shows more. So, brain fart. So the first one I want to ask is tell our audience a little bit about your background and how you came to do what you do now. Um, okay, so I I guess I started um, acting when I was going into high school. So uh, we were really lucky here where I live um, in Mississauga is where I grew up, Mississauga, Ontario. And there was an art school. So I had three older siblings and they all went to an art school called Poplar Park and um, they all went for visual arts. So I, when it came time for me to go to high school, my mom was like, oh, so you got to start getting your art portfolio ready. And I said, oh, I don't need one. I just, I'm going to do a monologue. <laughs> so she was quite surprised and um, she didn't really know what to do with me at that point. And um, so yeah, we... we I, you know, we just tried something new. She registered me at the local high school just in case if I didn't get in. Uh, but lucky for me, I made it. <laughs> and uh, that's that's where I learned a lot of, uh, it was more theater stuff that I did. Um, and then upon graduation though, I, I decided to just, I really wanted to go away for university. I wanted to, you know, you're kind of told all your life that being an actor is quite unrealistic. So I was trying to be realistic. So I went to a regular university. I went to Western, um, which is actually kind of known as a party school. Um, there are some serious students there, but it, I didn't really fall into that category. <laughs> um, not for the subjects I was studying anyway. So upon graduation from that, um, I, I was just trying to pay off my student loans. I didn't really know where to start. I was trying to get a real job, but at the same time, I was still, I still really wanted to pursue acting um, at that point. But I didn't, I didn't really know where to start. Um, as a, as a person of color, it's, 
it, it's kind of hard to imagine yourself in especially theater um you know tv was starting to break in a little bit um but you know the the roles they it, like i remember going to some of those auditions and it would be it's either you're specifically going for like a asian chinese network or you know you might get in as you know a side token you know asian person on a show um or something or not you know not even a show right even like a commercial uh, just like in the background so um anyway but i was really lucky uh, i saw an open call for a disney cruise line and i went um and i auditioned and i got a role um where i i did stage shows um as Mulan and that was really that was really fun um I did that for three contracts but it was on a cruise so I had to be away from home a lot um which was fun for the first couple times <laughs> but um after that you know you my sisters were having kids they were married you know I kind of wanted to settle down so I came back um and and I became a flight attendant while also still trying to audition on the side and stuff but the scheduling was hard um eventually I did get back into TV and film it was hard to do theater because of the time commitment um but yeah uh, and then I stopped again I kind of started and stopped with the acting thing many times and um after I had my second child um after the mat leave I decided you know what I'm just going to I'm just going to go for it I'm not going to wait for the baby weight to come off I'm not going to wait for in case we have another baby like I, I'm just going to go I'm just going to get some headshots I'm going to start submitting myself and that's what I did and that's when I landed Cutie Pugs as a series regular and um and then that was sort of I would say that that was sort of my start like 2017 when I shot that it didn't air until 2018 um but that's when I started doing TV film Absolutely. And by the way, you are beautiful. But the more I look at you, I'm like having days of vote. Did we is this the first time when we did the interview or is this the first time we met? Because I or, or, because the more I listen to you speak, I'm like, well, I guess it sounded really familiar. It's like, did we ever do an interview before? No. Okay, so I'm getting the confused with somebody else. I'm like, why is this sound for so familiar? Anyway, it's like brrr, brain fart on my part. <laughs> But I don't know, maybe 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 we're just, you know, in the right spot at the right time, <laughs> talking about the right stuff. No, absolutely. Now, I'm going to ask you about actually we can get to the whole stereotypes in a little bit. But I want to ask you about your background. Have you ever thought about being a interpreter or translator? Um, no, I I'm not even though I was I was born and raised in Canada and my parents do, did speak Chinese to us Cantonese and um I would say growing up I learned English and Cantonese probably at the same time because I had older siblings that were speaking English at home and of course and my mom knew English so it was sort of 50-50 but by the time I was 15 my mom so my parents got divorced my dad moved out so my mom was there but then she moved to Vancouver to for for work and because I had older siblings I didn't have to move which again very lucky um so I got to say and then so then it was just the four of us in a house speaking English all the time <laughs> so you know I I like I, I took Chinese school on Saturdays you know until grade 9 and and then that was it so i'm really not that fluent um in cantonese anymore um or maybe i don't think i was ever the reason i bring it up is i'm actually as the short home network the key fan to network is internationalized so i cover all of us from the different cities now i do canada england australia i actually did my first japan episode yesterday i think or yesterday day before But I want to interview people from China, but I need a translator. So, you know, that's like, hey, if you ever know anyone or, or yeah, you know, that's, it's... <laughs> yeah, that's probably going to be a tough market to break into. But I yeah. bet a lot of Chinese people, you know, probably, probably speak English. I know, I know people from Hong Kong do, like, very well. 
I was watching a documentary and I'm like how they flip. I, I always think that that's such an amazing skill to be able to flip between two languages so fluidly. Um, and I've seen interviews and I'm just like, I'm blown away. I'm blown away. I agree with you 100%, but I do have some great ideas for you off the air. But the other one I want to ask you is going back to the other class I want to ask you is, are you a study nerd when you were in college? Were you a study nerd or party animal? A party animal, <laughs> for sure. I read my roommate's highlights. I didn't even make my, I didn't even, I learned nothing. No, absolutely. For me, I always try to find the middle, but I never went to college, but I always try to find the medium and everything. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was real, I, I did really well in high school. I think that I worked harder in high school, but I think because I grew up in a, real, a really strict household, when I went to university and I was free for the first time, you know, I really just, I just went for it. Because it was just like, a, it was such a whole new world for me. You know, it's funny. When I think of college, have, have you ever seen Futurama? Futurama. I have, but I, I don't remember much from it. There's a line where Fry Sykes so says to Leela, Oh, I went to college. Yeah, but you know, 21st century college was pretty much an expensive daycare center. Right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, as you mentioned, being an actor isn't like a, a full-time job. Obviously, it's not like nine to five. But the first question I want to ask is, who influenced you to be an actor? And what did he major in? And did that influence, influence you to be an actor? Um, who influenced me to be an actor? I don't know. I think I just always loved, um, I loved storytelling. And I was just inspired by all the movies, you know, growing up, like I always watched movies. I was, I was always really into TV, like really into um, movies and television. And, and I guess I just, I just wanted to emulate what was happening um, on screen. Um, you know, I did not um, take acting in, in, in post-secondary school. I did go to drama um, I did go for drama when I was in high school, but that was it. And then it wasn't until after I graduated from regular university um, where I just took, you know, social sciences. I was a sociology major, which I guess is sort of just the study of watching people, which helps with your acting, I suppose. <laughs> um, and then, yeah. And then, I mean, I took other training outside of that, but... But yeah, there was no real formal training um, in, in a school setting for me. And what, what did he major in? Sociology. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you, you know, what did you want to be your big major? Did you just want to follow that degree that you took classes for and studied for? Or did that also say, you know, I want to have a bigger goal and reach my acting and do the two of them intertwine? Uh, well, I used to say that um, I wanted to be a lawyer slash actor. Ooh, and, there is a lot of them. Right, but I, I mean, I think, you know, I was kind of, it was an acceptable answer to my parents to say that I wanted to be a lawyer. And on TV, the lawyers looked really cool. So I, I, I think in the end, really what I wanted to do was play a lawyer on TV <laughs> is what I wanted. Um, because I think as, so when I went to university, that was sort of my thing. I was like, oh yeah, okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna go um, become a lawyer. So it was like undergraduate, so what do you take? So like I was a philosophy major. Um, and it was just sort of like, as I was taking the classes, as I was doing this stuff, I was like, what am I thinking? I was like, this is not what I'm interested in at all. Um, you know, like figuring out what a real lawyer does. <laughs> I'm like, this is not, this is not fun. You mean, you don't just go and like say, I object and argue with, <laughs> with people. Like there's so much other work you have to do. 
I don't know if I want to do this. So I kind of just came to the realization and it's also really, really expensive. I mean, as, as you know, I mean, schooling, I think in the States is even more expensive than it is in Canada, but it's really, it's, it can be quite unrealistic for many um, to even go to university, but to then move on and go into law school or, or some other, you know, masters or, or whatever it is. Um, and I, I was like, I've made enough debt with my undergrad. I don't need more debt. And to go down a path, like I was really just like, you know what, I'm, and I'm glad that I, I came to that conclusion. Um, and I didn't just keep pushing myself to go down a path that really deep down inside I knew I didn't want to do because so many so many people do that right because of their parents expectations um and and other things right so I, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't fall into that trap um but yeah I think my goal is always just to be a full-time actor um and yeah yeah so so I'm, I'm getting there no, absolutely. It's all about baby steps. Yeah, actually, I have one thing, you know, I have diary of the mouth, so something pops into my mind, I just blur it out. Yeah. Are you a fan of Family Guide? A Family Guy? Uh, I think I used to watch it a little bit, but I, I wasn't a huge fan. I wasn't a huge fan. I liked Simpsons. That was That was my thing. Um, for a long time, but I mean, I haven't caught up like on these. I can't believe it's still going with like new episodes. Like I can't, I can't believe it. Um, but yeah, I remember watching Simpsons like pretty religiously. The next question I want to ask you is about stereotypes. And I have a funny segment I like to tell you if you're all right with it. Sure. <laughs> There's a segment where, you know, uh, this Asian woman invites uh, just, uh, her husband, her boyfriend, to meet the family. And um, the guy's like, oh, what do you do? So like, oh, I have a startup company, not a real job. And he was like, well, how much do you make? He's like, oh, I make 24000 Welcome to family. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's, fuck, uh, excuse my language, it's, it's messed up, but it is really funny. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. Like, I, I do believe, you know, stereotypes are, they're not completely unfounded. <laughs> um, there is definitely high expectation in the Asian culture, at least traditionally, for people to fit in these like boxes where it's like, you know, accomplishment, accomplishment, accomplishment. They, they really base you on your achievements. And unfortunately, those achievements are generally based around monetary uh, gain status, um, you know, things that that really you shouldn't be graded on. But um, but that that is definitely um, something that traditionally has been in the Asian culture, um, which isn't. I mean, it's not all bad. I mean, I think that there's certainly a level of discipline that in the Asian cultures you don't you don't find in North America. You know, like in the U.S. and Canada, like you just don't find that type of discipline that these kids are are, and and, and then they'll amaze you with what they can do. Right. And you're just like, oh man, I should maybe I should have listened to my mom. Maybe I should have stuck with piano. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> But then on the flip side, you understand that sometimes not everyone can fit into that box. So I feel like I certainly didn't fit into to my box um, that that um, my my parents wanted me to fit into. But, you know, like I, I think my sisters did. They did pretty well doing what they're doing um, in their traditional roles and, and that type of stuff. And they're happy. It's not like everybody's unhappy. <laughs> It's just, yeah, it's it's finding those um, those being able to, and that's the hard part about being a parent. And me as a parent now, it's like you know, knowing when to push and when to just let go. I agree with you. Now it's the last eleven minutes. I'm gonna ask you some hard hitting questions. Okay. And then you can ask me anything you want. But the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, my former sister-in-law, you know, I'm going to throw myself underneath the bus. I like Asian women. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Um, so, but the reason I bring it up is, you know, I know someone, my former sister-in-law, 
it used to be like look at other Asian women in the left that they have if they have an expensive purse but she had to go get an expensive purse and you see like um, hold herself to a higher standard so with that it's all stereotype it's like is it stereotypes or is it just you know I want to have what they have um, well I think that I mean it's a stereotype but I think it's it's there's so many things that um, you you know I, I've been learning a lot about personal development and how your brain is wired and you know sort of like your nature versus nurture and your brain is it's really it's, you know neuroplasticity and being able to change but you know in those beginning years your brain is really being molded and and your neurons that are firing consistently those are things that become um almost you know it's like a piece of thread where you keep making it thicker and thicker and thicker and then next thing you know it's like you can't even break it even though it started as a thin thread whereas the stuff that you didn't really build on um you know they just kind of disappear so if you've been sort of trained in a certain way of thinking your brain you know it really gets formed that way from a young age and if if you're still steeped in that culture time and time again eventually it's going to be really hard to break that type of thinking and instead you're going to use your own you're going to make excuses and you're going to reason yourself into continuing to believe a certain thing. So, you know, I mean, did I think that when I was younger, like, oh, you know, I needed to um, marry, you know, a, a rich man who had a big business. And, you know, I, I still, I always, I always wanted to work. Like I was always like, I'm going to make the money. Uh, cause that's sort of how I was brought up. But I remember my mom always being quite embarrassed of that cause she worked and, um, she, she made more money because when, when they came to Canada, my mom was the one that spoke English and she went to school and she did all that, but my, my dad didn't. So she always, even though she was making the money because her brain was so steeped in this tradition of you know, status where your husband is making all this money and women don't have to work. She was, she was embarrassed of her accomplishments, right? So for me, I was always like, no, I'm going to work. I'm going to make money. But still in my mind, I was like, oh, but I still need like an older man, a man who's going to take care of me, right. who's, who's going to maybe pay for my law school. So I don't have to worry about it. I'll still be a lawyer, but I don't have to worry about paying the debt. You know what I mean? And it wasn't until, you know, I was like, you know, in the middle of high school where I was just like, what am I thinking? Right. And it's because I'm in, I'm in, you know, in a different culture. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's when my mom, <laughs> I think it's when hmm, things are coming out for me now. Um, like, I think at that point, it's like you, you lose that influence now, that constant influence that you start to think for yourself and you're, you start reasoning more and you're just like, what is it that I actually want? What is it that I actually care about? And why do I feel this way? And really breaking it down and analyzing how you really feel. Um, and then you, and that's what you have to do. Like you're still going to be triggered by certain subconscious thoughts, right? 75% of our thoughts every day is just, and what we do is all subconscious. So, um, you know, it's even like, you know, what, what is it that makes Asian women attractive to you? Right? Like, I mean, we all have our preferences, but it's like, if you really bring it all the way back, you know, you don't even remember, right? Maybe, maybe as a baby, there was an Asian lady that was super nice to you and you don't even remember what it was, but it's stuck in your mind somehow in the subconscious where you kind of want to repeat that feeling or you know so i mean we're getting we're getting, getting pretty deep <laughs> with that but um <laughs> that makes sense. You get a, a normal conversation yeah so you know these stereotypes they do come from somewhere they come from um a culture but culture changes right. and as there's an evolution and different cultures are mixing 
that's when you're getting that evolution and you know it's it's things to be aware of um when we're making generalizations about people and cultures but it's like you know it stems from somewhere yes we acknowledge it's changing but it is funny because a lot of you know a lot of it is true it's true i give you an example i don't talk to my other side of the family because they're assholes <laughs> but they start off very really sweet and one of them i don't know i i I know, I know, I throw myself under the bus, but I really don't give a shit. <laughs> That's saying I'm censored. But one of them was really nice, and then she became a lawyer, and then all of a sudden, from being very sweet, saying, I'm never going to turn, I'm never going to be a, you know, stuck-up bitch, to all of a sudden, she's like, oh, I have to have this Gucci bag, and I have to have this Willy Baton, and I have to have millions of dollars, and now I have a nanny. I'm like, Jesus Christ. You know, as I said, I'm censored. Jesus Christ, you really became a giant hypocrite as saying you're never going to become this person, but here you are being this giant person. You have to have your own nanny. You have to have this. You have to have ex expensive things. Yeah. So it's like like you said, it's you marry into family, you marry someone, not even marry into family, marry someone who has money, and then all of a sudden you're entitled. And it doesn't matter if it's an Asian thing, it, uh, it, it it's a white thing. It, it it has nothing to do with stereotypes. It means if you have an addictive personality, it's a drug. You know, it's someone who likes boxing and then they constantly get into fights it's a drug because you like that adrenaline rush if you like gambling gambling is a drug because you like that adrenaline oxytocin or whatever the hell you want to call it it makes you go back into more and more but i made a promise to myself a long time ago i will i, I do want to become famous but i will work a nine to five job I will stay the same person who I always am, and I will never change myself. Yes, I have. If I had millions of dollars, I don't have to worry about taxes and health care and worry about being on my own. But that's a safety net. You should always have a safety net of saying, I am better off and I'm secured, but mentally, you should stay the same person who you always are. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I mean, I, I think that I think that sometimes it, it just becomes a thing, right? I mean, not knowing your your sister in law or, or everybody's specific situation. It's like, you know, now you've entered in, um, you, you know, it's like all of a sudden you've entered into a different culture. Now the people that you're running with have this certain level of, you know, belongings. Right. Where it's like, okay, so everybody's driving a Porsche. I don't really want to show up in my Honda anymore, right? Because maybe, maybe they're making fun of her. Maybe she feels that it negatively influences how she show right, to clients. Like maybe clients are like, I don't, I want a lawyer who's so successful that they have a Porsche. I don't want a lawyer that's, you know, running around driving a Honda, right? And, and again, that's also the client, you know, having this, poor view because hondas are great cars <laughs> um but you know what i mean like but but that that becomes part of it too so um and it's a certain level of you know you know you, you need a certain level of confidence um to say i don't care you know I, i'll get my clients that that are okay with me driving a honda or whatever right like like uh, but if anyway I, I'm just saying that there's always there's always um <laughs> there's always something that that when you enter it's like you enter into a different level like you level you know and it's not necessarily leveling up I don't want to say like you're leveling up or leveling down but you've just entered into an alternate sort of universe and it's like the players here operate differently so it's either you try to blend in and fit in with that group um or you stay at your at your whatever you know skin that you were in and then you 
and then you, you're always sort of that outcast. I it's agree hard. with you. Now, I do have a couple questions for you off the air, but wrapping up her talk show, I want you to be brutally honest. When I first approached you and be a guest on my talk show, but made you say yes, how do you feel now? And what do you recommend it to other people? Um, yeah, I mean, what made me say yes, like, I, you know, I, I love to talk, as you can see, I talk a, a lot. Um, you know, I believe in what you stand for. Um, and yeah, I, I would recommend this. This is, this is a fun little, little way to get, get to know people and um, just to spend, spend some time chatting with, with uh, like minded individuals, I guess. I appreciate it. I have like 50, maybe like, let's see, I like 25 questions on over here, plus 14. I think that's like 35 questions, give or take. Let's just say 40. I have two pages worth, but we always stayed on the first section. But like I said, I'm not easily good at reading a script. So it's always good to get back into the rhythm. But I do want to ask you one more thing before we go and talk off the air is what is next for you? What's on the horizon, number one? And how can our fans and listeners get in touch with you? Um, so what's on, I mean, I, I've still, I've, I've still been auditioning. Year's not over yet. I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, you know, aiming to, to line up work for the new year. Um, and I, I started coaching. Um, fellow actors and I've started um, one one specific account like on Instagram for beginning actors so what I found was when I was trying to break into the business all the acting classes that you take are for scene study right so that means that they're training you to read five six seven pages of sides where you have a pretty good role that you can break down and you can analyze and you can do all this work but when you're first starting out as an actor most of the time you don't have any lines you don't have any lines or if you do it's like oh can I take your order um you you don't have the luxury of like oh so what's my backstory and what's all this stuff and then you walk into an audition and you're like can I take your order you know or you you, you, you don't know what to do. You don't know how to present yourself. You don't know what it is that that matters. And then you end up in this loop where you're just like, I'm trying to do what I think they want me to do. Um, which, you know, you, you're never going to know. You're never going to know what they want. Um, which is another thing that that you kind of figure out as, as you're in the business for longer. Um, and because it's such a high rejection rate job, you you really have to develop a mindset and it's the mindset that really sets you apart from other actors um and these are just the things that that i want to share you know along my journey you know i and, and i've and i've learned these things from multiple different coaches like i i, I don't believe that you learn this you know from just one person ever you know and they can be spectacular but you take what you resonates with you from that person you take it and then you might hear the same thing from somebody else but it's going to resonate differently how they speak how they you know how they hold themselves but or maybe it's just the timing it's going to click for you and you're just like oh my god like i've heard it before but not like that and now i get it so I think it's just, it's actors helping other actors to figure it all out. Cause some, like there's so many questions and, and, and it doesn't matter like what level you're at. You're always, you're always, you know, people are saying no to you and shutting the door in your face constantly. So you really have to figure out a way to get past that, through that, and then keep going. Um, and then of course remain true to your family and your friends and, and everything else. I agree with you 100 percent Now we're going over time. Yeah. But wrapping up, it was a real honor put having you as a guest. And don't worry, your Instagram will be on the bottom of the screen. Perfect. And, and in the description in the box. But wrapping up, it was a real honor put having you as a guest. Looking forward to part two down the road. One thing I do want to plug real fast, January 8th 
will be my holiday episode. I would love to have you a part of it. June 10th is my nine-year anniversary. Definitely stay tuned. But to our fans and listeners, make sure to check out our beautiful guest. She's a fantastic actress. But you have a fantastic future in the entertainment world. Anything you need, you can count on me. But wrapping up, it was a real honor to put having you as a guest. And until we meet again, I'll catch you later. Bye.